Have you ever had a conversation that just sticks with you and changes how you think about your life? I interviewed the self-made British rapper, weightlifter, and political troublemaker, Zuby, over a year ago to promote my first book, <laughs> Clueless at the Work. Every few days, I mull over what Zuby shared in that discussion. He is one of the most inspiring and hardworking musicians I've ever met. He's been hustling and grinding since 2006 and has exploded on every online network. He'll be doing his second Joe Rogan episode later this year. He's coming up on half a million Twitter followers and his most recent viral tweet has reached over 5 million people. Zuby is one of the people who've inspired me to quit my full-time day job and go into business for myself. He's helped me to see the potential of Make Weird Music if I just keep producing content that people want to consume. He's increased my desire to take better care of my body and my mind. He's young, smart, tech-savvy, and perfectly comfortable getting under people's skin. And while his music isn't weird, his attitude is. He is unafraid and expresses his creativity without apology. That certainly makes him unusual, whether you agree with him or not. In the words of Bill Nye, everyone in the world knows something you don't and he has taught me plenty about unbridled artistic expression. Today's guest is Zuby. He is a rapper from England who grew up in Saudi Arabia, and he lives in England again. Uh, he has a book called Strong Advice, Zuby's Guide to Fitness for Everyone. And the main reason I wanted to talk to him is he is a troublemaker. Me? Yeah, you. Me? <laughs> so, Zuby, <laughs> thanks for joining us today. Um, I met him in New, uh, New York City when I was yeah. just randomly on a trip there with my wife. She was going on the Dr. Oz show, and Zuby was having kind of a meetup. So that was pretty cool to hang out. Yeah, that was a good night, man. I, I enjoyed that. I was amazed by how many people showed up, to be honest, man, because it, it was a pretty last-minute thing. Uh, but that was one of the coolest things, actually, about my U.S. trip was just being able to host meetups in different city at late notice and just have a whole bunch of cool people show up and everyone was really cool. Everybody got along with everybody, had some great conversations, good food, everything like that. So yeah, it's uh, it's an unorthodox thing to do, but I'm, I'm very glad that I did it. So a couple things I wanted to definitely cover today. Uh, the, Id the idea of promoting your work and getting bringing attention to what you do uh, I have a book called Clueless at the Work, and it's largely about people who are getting started in things and they think they have more wisdom than they actually do. And it, you can end up in that position for 10, 20, 30 years. You can end up in a position where you're a senior or something or other, and you're still pretty clueless. But the difference between, uh, I think, an experienced person you can trust and a, an experienced person you can't is one knows when they are clueless and the other doesn't. <laughs> I, I like that. that. That sounds pretty pretty accurate in terms of what I have noticed myself. So you started out as a rapper, and now you have, in the past year, exploded on Twitter. So can you talk a little bit about your history and talk about how you've made your work visible to other people? Yeah, sure thing. So, um, so I was born in the UK. I grew up in Saudi Arabia. Went to boarding school in the UK from the age of 11. I did really well in school, and then I got an offer from Oxford University. So I went to Oxford to study science, uh, sorry, computer science. When I was in my first year there as an undergrad, I just started rapping as a hobby. It was uh, something I just started initially out of boredom and out of my love of hip hop as a fan of hip hop since I was about 11 or 12. And I just started rapping and I picked it up fairly quickly. I, uh, one of my friends, Chris, who, who, um, lived on the same floor as me. He had a basic recording studio in his uh, dorm room. So I used to just go in there and freestyle and rap and get beats off of the internet. And I, I used to just record some tracks. And I made my very first song, which was called The Bad Man. I made that about three months into when I first started rapping. And I just emailed it out to my friends, played it to people. And, you know, people were like, yo, this, this is good. You've got, you've got some talent there. Keep, keep going. So um, I, ma I made a couple more songs. And then Fast forward less than one year, I released my very first independent album, which was called Commercial Underground. So that was, um, it was just a short album, seven track album, more like an EP maybe. Mm -hmm. And um, I actually sold over 3,000 copies of that album. Wow. Independently. That's yeah. amazing. Thank you very much. Thank you. So um, I used to just go around the city 
and I'd go to uh, Corn Market Street in Oxford, which is the main pedestrianized high street. And I used to just go there with my headphones and play my tracks to people, tell them who I was, introduce myself, and people would buy my CDs. After doing that in Oxford for a while, I started traveling out to London and selling my CDs in central London and also a few other cities in the UK. Now, after I graduated, I already had um, a job offer to work for a consulting company, but I wanted to take a year out. I mean, I was still young. I, I graduated when I was only 20. With the computer and, science um, degree? Yeah, that's right. Right on. That's cool. Yeah. So thank you. So um, I wanted, I'd, I already had my second album written at this point. So I wanted to take a year out and just do my music full time. So I went and I recorded my second album again with my friend, Chris. That album was called The Unknown Celebrity. Because at this stage, I was starting to, you know, gain some traction and I had my own little fan base. I had my I'm Down With Zuby t-shirts and stuff that mm -hmm. people used to know and recognize and people still do, funnily enough. <laughs> always, I've always worn my own merchandise from the beginning. Yep. Um, so I released that album and I traveled a little bit more extensively around the UK, promoting it and just doing the street hustle, building up my fan base, literally one person at a time, just hitting the street, going to random cities I'd never been to, talking to people who I'd never met before and convincing them to buy my music by playing it to them. And now, so before you go on about that, what mm. does that take? Like, how do you convince one person balls. at a time? What's that? Balls. <laughs> I said it takes balls. <laughs> what was that experience like for you? Like, how do you develop oh, confidence doing, doing that? Okay. So the very first time I ever went out to sell my CDs, I was, I was shook. I was scared, right? I was just standing there in the middle of the high street, looking at all these people rushing by shopping, you know, just going about their business, you know, obviously walking past me, nobody knows who I am. I don't know who anybody else is. But um, eventually, I, I kind of built up, built up the courage to approach somebody. I can't even remember what my first approach would have consisted of. But, um, you know, I eventually got someone to stop. And I imagine in hindsight, probably very um, cautiously introduced myself to them and my music. And, you know, they were interested in listening to it. So uh, I, I, gave them the headphones and they had a little listen and they were like, yeah, how much do you want for it? And I was like, um, I think at this stage, I think beginning I, I was selling my album for, I think I started out selling it for just four pounds. So that's about, you know, five or $6. So, um, yeah. And the, yeah. So he, he bought my album and that was my first sale. I do think the first person I approached, I think the first person that stopped, if I remember correctly, I think the first person that stopped did buy. Mm. And that was just the, that was like the magic moment. I was like, wow, someone just paid me. You know, someone just paid me for right. my album. A stranger, no, not, not just somebody, a stranger paid me for my album. So mm -hmm. be, before this, I'd already sold my albums to, you know, my friends in university, some of my family members, people close to me who were like, oh, cool, Zuby's got an album. Yep. Of course, I'll buy Zuby's album. But this was my first time going outside of my circle. So that was like a magical moment for me, right? Looking at that money in my hand and being like, wow, like, you know, random strangers are willing to purchase my music. And so then my mindset shift was, okay, well, if I can, if, if I can sell one, I, I can sell two, right? Mm -hmm. And I, the very first day I went out, I think I took out like literally five CDs or something because my expectations were very, very low. I, right. I didn't want to, uh, you know, go out with 50 CDs and come back with 50 CDs. So I think I just took five and I was like, all right, I'm just going to stay out there until I can, uh, you know, try to sell these. And I sold out of all of them. Now, it may have taken me like, it may have probably took me like two or three hours just because I was, I was very hesitant to approach people. I didn't yet have the confidence. But um, I did sell all of the CDs that I went out with on the first day. You know, the next time I went out, I took 10 CDs and I was like, okay, I'm going to try to sell, I'm going to try to sell 10. And um, eventually, I, quickly, I realized it was, um, you know, it was, it was a numbers game, right? If I talk to, you know, seven, if I approach seven or eight people, one of them will buy. So right. it's like, okay, I want to sell 10. I might need to approach, you know, 50, 60, 70 people. Uh, but if I do that, then I, I will, I will sell that many. And, um, yeah, this continued on for, for many years. I, I'm sort of fast forwarding a little bit, but, um, you know, I can now say I've sold over, I sold over 25,000 albums. That's amazing. Around the, 
<laughs> like when I say I sold them, I mean like literally like I personally, <laughs> I have first, I have personally sold over 25,000 albums hand to hand. You probably the spoke day. to 75,000 people, right? Oh, more than that, dude. Way more. Hundreds oh of thousands. Goodness. Yeah. Hundred, oh, dude, I wish I had a one in three conversion rate. That would be beautiful. <laughs> yeah. I mean, may, maybe one in three people actually stops to talk to you. Oh, wow. And then out of that, maybe one in three people will buy. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, so it all started out just with a street hustle. And then in 2014, alongside my friend Shadow, who's also an independent artist, we uh, opened up a pop-up shop called the Blue and Purple Store. And from 2014 to 2018, we took that store to about 10 different shopping malls in the UK. We think we did about 30 pop-up shops in total, normally for like a week or two at a time. And there we'd, we'd sell our music. We'd sell, um, we had our own brand of headphones. So we'd sell our headphones. We'd sell our merchandise, t-shirts, hats, hoodies. If you go on my website, teamzubi.com, you'll see I've got tons of merchandise there. So yeah, it went from the street hustle for several years and uh, going literally all over the UK, whatever the weather, I've hustled in the rain, sleet, snow, everything. And then, yeah, eventually it moved into the shopping centers and having our own physical shop, you know, first independent artist in the UK to kind of do that in the way that we did so um in the last year a lot of my sort of hustle has sort of shifted online to the online realm so i haven't done a pop-up shop now since the last one i did was about this time last year january 2019 was the last one that i did um but uh yeah i'm now looking into new models but it all started i mean it's funny i've done so many interviews and podcasts but it's rare for someone to actually dig into this story because not a lot of people realize, you know, so many people discovered me last year and people always discover you where you're at. So they just kind of see the tip of the iceberg. A lot of people don't realize, like if people knew the true story of like how much grind and hustle I've been through over the last 2006, most, mostly, mostly self-inflicted by the way, right? Mm -hmm. Because I've got an Oxford degree. I didn't need to become a rapper <laughs> or, right. or anything like that. Um, and so, yeah, oh, I, I didn't even say, you know, I did work in the corporate world for three years, 2008 to 2011, November, 2011, I quit my job and went to do music full-time. So I've been a full-time entrepreneur musician since, uh, November, 2011. So, you know, and I haven't died yet. I'm still surviving and thriving <laughs> and continuing to grow. So, um, yeah, it can be done. That's amazing. So I run a uh, YouTube channel called Make Weird Music, and it en ended mm -hmm. up with, where I was able to build this recording studio around me. Uh, and I built a lot of it with my bare hands. And there's not enough, like, emphasis on the hustle and the grind that it takes to go from nothing to something. Mm -hmm. And you said you were selling your CD for four pounds when you started. What were you selling it yeah. in January 2019? Uh, 10. 10 pounds. Oh, no, no, 12. 12, sorry. All right. So one thing I want to cover with you is your ebook. A lot of people think, mm. well, an ebook doesn't, it doesn't cost you anything. It's pure profit, right? So it should be, what, eight bucks, 10 bucks, 12 bucks. But you, you are not pricing it there. So can you talk a little bit about your ebook pricing and your, mo uh, your kind of mental motivation behind that? Yeah, sure. My ebook is $39, which I think is extraordinarily cheap for the value that people get from it. Uh, someone actually messaged me last week and they've lost 50 pounds since they bought it. So, and that's directly using the information in there. I mean, you do have to put the information, uh, you do have to use it. Um, I can't just, you know, magically make you burn calories by reading a book, but it gives people all the tools that they need. So, I mean, I've been, I've been going to the gym for even longer than I've been rapping. Right. I started working out when I was 15 or 16, yeah, 15. I started training. I'd, I'd say I started working out at 15. I'd say I started training maybe at 18 because I didn't know what I was doing for the first couple of years. And I, I wanted to write something that will help people avoid all of the pitfalls that I went through in terms of training, in terms of nutrition, diet, motivation, everything like that. So I've basically taken 16, 17 years worth of knowledge and trial and error and distilling away all of the, all of the nonsense and all of the falsehoods and just keeping the real meat that people need to know. So whether their goal is to build muscle, to burn fat, to get in shape, to get stronger, to um, look better, feel better, whatever their fitness goal is, I can help them reach that. And I, I wanted to make a very simple, concise book that will help people to 
achieve that goal. Now, based on what that value is, I mean, if you think of what people will pay, I mean, my, my book costs $39. Sometimes I do sales on it, but uh, typically it's $39. And um, for everything I have just described and for that 16, 17 years of knowledge, I think that is um, a very, very reasonable and affordable price. If someone isn't willing to invest 39 bucks to, um, you know, hit their hit their gym goals and get their physique and their mindset in check then yeah i don't honestly think that they're all that serious so maybe it's a bit of a natural filter so i think it i think it gets the people on board who are who are serious and as we know you know if people get something for free sometimes they don't value it i don't i don't want to say this is true in all cases there are things we get for free which we certainly do value but when it comes to a product or a service that people are going to be paying for, if they get it for free or for very, very cheap, it's just natural human inclination to not value it in the same way. And I think also you attract worse customers if you make the price too low. So I wanted to make sure it's affordable for everybody, but that the people who are going to buy it are actually going to use it and put it into practice. Well, you inspired me to uh, lose 30 pounds last year. I started... Uh, oh, for real? Yeah, yeah. You you posted some videos of yourself lifting weights, and then I started lifting some weights. And uh, you and Nassim Taleb and that guru anaerobic guy and a couple others, you're all posting videos and photos of yourself lifting weights. So I'm like, all right, I'm going to do some deadlifts. And uh, I think you commented when I first did it, but that was like a hundred thousand users ago or followers ago. But <laughs> yeah, I've, I've lost 30 pounds in the last year and uh, partially awesome. due to you. And I've also started copying some of your um, book sales strategy where I, I'm saying like, I, I've got 10 copies and mm -hmm. I will sign them. And if you buy them here, you know, I'll get, you get a sticker, you get the free audio book and you get the book itself. And just watching the copies go down, you know, at 10, nine, eight, yeah. seven, it creates the scarcity effect, but also it made me realize, oh, people do want to buy this book. Like mm -hmm. I have put a lot, my whole lifetime has led up to this book and it is worth paying for. But you know, coming from a computer science background, everything we use is free. And so for <laughs> me, it's been hard to go from open source, you know, like mm. knowledge is free, Wikipedia is free, all of this stuff is free. Even if it isn't free, it's free for us. Yeah, yeah. And then when I put my life's work down on paper, I'm like, why do I have to charge for this? But I think it's that open source computer science mindset that made me think this isn't worth paying for because I'm not paying for Wikipedia. And $10 a month from Netflix gets me access to like 10,000 movies but if someone's paying my Patreon $10 a month and I'm putting like two or three videos together a month, it's like, mm -hmm. it's hard for me to, um, I, I start equating or comparing. And so I have my own troubles with the pricing. So I'm really, I've been inspired by you and I'm really excited to hear your backstory on where you've come from with the pricing. Did you start the book at $39? Yeah, it was 39 off the bat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I was actually going to do it for, for 49 but um, I thought, yeah, let me make it. Let me make it thirty nine. I think that's a, I think that's kind of a sweet spot. And um, yeah, I mean, this is funny. I mean, what you said is uh, it's something that a lot of creative people, in particular, actually struggle with. Certainly, a lot of musicians have this problem. I mean, mm -hmm. I remember we were talking about me selling twenty five thousand albums. Do you know the amount of people who advised me inverted commas that I should be giving my CDs out for free? Right. Right. The amount of people who are like, oh, well, if you want to promote yourself, give it free. I was like, no, my music has value. And I know if I give someone a free CD, what are they going to do? They're going to use it as a coaster. They're going to use it as That's a frisbee. Right. They're not going to listen to it. Everyone who buy, everyone, someone who pays five pounds or 10 pounds or eight pounds or 12 pounds for my CD, they're going to go home and they're going to listen to it. No question. They are absolutely going to listen to it. If I'm just standing in the center, chucking out CDs for free, first of all, I'm losing money because mm -hmm. we're talking physical product here too, right? Right. So, Every CD I give away, I'm literally just just losing money. Yep. And so many of those are just going to end up in end up in the trash. And I don't even know if the people who are who are who are buying it are going to like the music. With me, I used to play my songs to people before they bought it. Mm. So I would already know. Okay, this person, if they like the three songs I played them enough to buy the album, you know, I'd play people, you know, little thirty second snippets. 
And it's like, well, you know, if they don't like it, that's fine. No problem. If they do like it and they're willing enough to buy it, then cool. I've just, I've just made a fan. And I also think um, from a more business perspective and an audience building perspective, I think it's important to sort of train your audience to pay for stuff, right? We live in this age where, you know, a lot of people have this weird entitlement mentality. And you, like you said, so many things are free or at least free at the point of service that people just expect everything to be free, which is kind of weird. Again, especially if you're a creative, right? If you, you, you could make like a whole movie, right? Put all this money, tens, hundreds of thousands of dollars or pounds into making a film and people like expect it to be free. You can spend tens of thousands of dollars or pounds making a music album and people just expect it to be free. You spend all this time making a book, can, you know, not just the time writing it. I mean, like you said, it's your life's work, right? You've had to go through years and years of experience to even put this together. It's the same with my book, the, the way, you know, it, it's, it's looking at the, there's almost two ways of looking at the value, okay? So you could look at a, a physical CD and think, oh, okay, I can buy like 10 blank CDs for five bucks or something. So this is just worth 50 cents. It's like, no, the, the content of the CD is, is what you're buying. Mm -hmm. a, book isn't, a book isn't just a book. Some books are worth $300. Right. Some, some books cost $500. Some books cost two bucks. Some books are free. And that's fine. It's like the content of the book matters. If you're buying some, um, I don't know, me medical, medical textbook or some specialist document that's created for surgeons or some, you know, some super special technical engineering document, you'll pay hundreds of dollars for that. Um, whereas if it's, you know, a children's book of nursery rhymes, then yeah, sure. Maybe 50 bucks, you'll, you'll, you'll balk at that because the value isn't there. But if something is going to change your life potentially, or help you earn more money or help you get in shape or help you have a much better relationship or marriage or whatever it is, I mean, what, what value do people what value do people put on those things? Like you, you, they should be putting a lot of value on those things. What else does a uh, 40 bucks get you, right? It might get you a couple of movie tickets and some popcorn or, um, or even if you think within the, within the same realm, okay, how much does a personal training session with a personal trainer cost? Right. Right. For, for one hour. Mm -hmm. And that's just one hour. And then, and then it's, it's gone. Right. Whereas with, um, with my book, it's like, yeah, somebody buys that. And then for the rest of their life, they can refer back to it and be like, oh, okay, actually, wait, hang on. I need, I need to get my, how do I, I want to lose fat. How do I, how do I set up my diet? Let me go back and check Zuby's book. Oh, okay. I want to go and build some muscle. What are the, what are the best exercises to do this? How do I structure my sets and my reps and plan my workouts throughout the week? It's like, that's, that's all in there and it's in there forever. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, I think when it's, when it's sort of explained to people like this, I think people are more like, oh, okay, yeah, that's, that's totally worth it. But if you just say it's a book and it costs $40, then people are like, oh, that's an expensive book. And it's like, yeah, but the, 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 the book is just the medium. The book is just the vehicle. That's right. It's really the knowledge and the value. And um, as far as I'm concerned, it's, it's actually cheap. I think it's underpriced. <laughs> so you've got some pretty thick skin. Uh, I would imagine going out and speaking to hundreds of thousands of people uh, gives you some resilience. And mm. what you do on Twitter is kind of like you stir the pot. You don't say anything what? particularly controversial. <laughs> Most of the time, it's not that controversial. Sometimes it is, but you you pick out <clears throat> sort of like a subgroup on Twitter, and then you'll say something maybe inflammatory or maybe what people say is common <laughs> sense, right? But then you kind of like, you just swat them down and, and it's kind of like <laughs> any, any awareness is good awareness. You're still getting people to notice you and you've mm. skyrocketed in terms of mentions. And, and when you came to the U S what was it? Nine, a nine week visit. Mm, yeah, yeah. And you were on, well, you can go ahead and share all the different shows you're on and, and what a huge rise, a meteoric rise that nine week visit allowed you to, uh, to ride. Yeah. I mean, the U S trip was crazy. So, um, I can't list everything I was on, but, um, in terms of the massive ones, uh, the Joe Rogan experience, the Ben Shapiro show, the Rubin report, the Glenn Beck podcast. Um, I was on Fox news twice. I was on Tucker Carlson tonight. I was also on, um, blaze TV, the several shows there. 
Um, there, there were loads more. You there, sat like in the bunch of them. in uh, Vice President Pence's uh, chair in his office, right? <laughs> yeah, I got, I got invited to the White House twice. I mean, I've got I've got fans in the White House. Like I didn't know that until I got to D.C. and I was in the White House, and people recognize I got I got recognized in the White House. That's like, wild. People were coming up to me and were like, oh, Zuby, oh man, I love what you, I love your stuff. Like I love. I was like really like, i'm in the white house. <laughs> I'm, I'm like some I'm, I'm a random independent rapper from the uk but i have i have fans in the white house so i was like this is this is pretty cool so one uh, final topic and then i'll let you go uh, i'd like to cover is being serious and mm-hmm. i think a lot of people they just they kind of think life is just going to happen to them and if it doesn't that's unfair Whereas there are people like you who will go out in rain and snow and whatever and sell a CD in person, you know, make eye contact with every single customer, even Mm -hmm. the people who say no, even the people who refuse to even acknowledge you exist. And, you know, there's a lot of Twitter commentary about you being conservative and you're black and this and that, but... No one talks about how thick your skin is. And I think you have some of the thickest skin I've seen on Twitter. Uh, But also that comes from being serious and you, Mm. you're not taking your mission lightly. Now I, I don't know how to articulate your mission because you have some several things going on. I have one big one. What's that? I want to have a positive impact on over 10 million people. Well, that's an awesome mission. How do you, how do you stay serious about that? And what do you have to say to people who think they're serious, but they're not? And I know you can identify people who think they're serious and they're not. Yeah, sure. Uh, So I want to, I want to say it's a, it's a combination of being very serious and not being serious. (laughs) Okay. You mean like uh, joking around? Yeah. Well, there's a fine balance. So what I mean is that in terms of fulfilling my mission and meeting my pretend potential and meeting all of my goals, I am a very, very serious individual. Mm-hmm. But when it comes to the process of that and how I view life in general, I can be very serious and I am very serious at times, but I'm always careful not to take myself nor the world nor everything that happens in the world too seriously. And I think that's why I appeal to a lot of people because people know I have a sense of humor, right? I'm, I'm multifaceted. I can, I can be serious, but I make jokes. I troll. I, I kick the hornet's nest sometimes. Sometimes I'll, you know, I'm just, I'm just me. And I'm like that in real life. I'm, I, don't have a, I don't have a Twitter persona. Mm-hmm. I mean, you've met me in real life, right? right. I'm the same. I'm just, I'm just me. I'm just Zuby. And I found that. And what I used to actually do was I used to hide that side of my personality online right? It's not that like my personality shifted. It's just that I used to be like, okay, in private, I'm, I'm going to be totally Zuby. And on stage, I'm going to be Zuby. Why, why did you, why did you hide it? Well, that's, that's a good question, man. I think it takes a while to become confident enough in yourself to put yourself out there publicly in a true sense. And most people don't do it. Even the biggest celebrities in the world, it's very rare to find one who's like truly real and authentic, at least in the public eye. Mm-hmm. If you meet them in private, you'll, you'll be like, okay, cool. Like, this guy's real. But in public, they have a very public persona. And with me, you know, stuff just kind of got to a stage where, I mean, I, I, di- I didn't plan on becoming some kind of socio-political commentator or kind of being known for my, my thoughts or my beliefs or anything like that. But what happened was the world just started going sideways in a lot of ways. And I started seeing a lot, just, just a lot of weird stuff cropping up and going on. And I didn't see a lot of people in the public world sort of challenging it or questioning it or anything. It's part of the same reason why I think, uh, you know, Jordan Peterson became so popular, not because he was saying something that's sort of totally outlandish, but just in a world where stuff has gone kind of weird someone who just sort of tells quite basic truths and is willing to stand up to the mob and is willing to sort of stick their neck out there when other people won't for, for valid, for various reasons. Um, turns out that that's actually really popular mm-hmm. and people, people really respect that and gravitate to it because like I said, for various reasons, a lot of people 
you know, some re- some of these reasons are good. Some of them are not so good as far as I'm concerned. But a lot of people don't really want to stick their head above the parapet. So you need those people who are willing to do it. And with me, look, I've, I've got certain principles and I've got certain limits of where, where I'm happy to speak out or th- there's a stage where I feel like I have to speak on something. Mm. Does that make sense? So there's a lot of stuff like, you know, goes by and either I don't have an opinion on or I don't have an opinion that's well formed and strong enough to sort of want, want to put it out there in any public forum. But with a lot of stuff that's been going on and it's just kind of been clicking together over the last sort of five years, maybe a lot of the conversations that I've been having in private with people, I'm now just sort of having in public. And it's almost like now that I know people, now that I know people like that and I've sort of established something there, it's like, okay, well, it's, that's already there. And, and it's kind of, it's kind of freeing actually, because I've already faced 30 different Twitter mobs. So, <laughs> so it's, it's kind of like at this stage, I don't care, right? Like I care deeply about what people I know and, you know, people who, who really like me or whatever. I care deeply about what they, what they think about me. But in terms of, you know, random people who are never going to like me or have just decided they don't like me or whatever, I've gotten a lot better at just not even caring what they think like when i started in my music you know um right. yeah when i first started in music it, it was very painful if someone said something bad about me or if someone didn't like my songs or whatever i I'd take it kind of personally because i wasn't used to that sort of criticism but as you said over the years the skin gets thicker and thicker and thicker i mean i've got a pretty much like an exoskeleton now <laughs> to the point where stuff just stuff just bounces off me someone can say right. the most horrible crap about me online the most awful thing. And I've already seen it, you know, and I don't, I don't like it, but at the same time, I kind of have a rule. Look, don't, don't let, don't let a stranger, a stranger online's opinion about you derail you or control you or upset you. Cause I just imagine that sometimes I'll read a comment and I'm like, I'm almost imagining the kind of person who would even say that and it's like, look, this just reflects on them. This isn't saying anything about me. I know who I am. I'm straight. I'm cool. People who know me know who I am. Like I've got literally at this stage, hundreds of thousands of people who like me and know what I represent and know that I'm true, what I'm true to and know that I'm not any of these things that my detractors may like to claim that I am. So if you're confident in yourself, then there's nothing really anyone can say that's going to totally rattle you. Because look, if someone says something about me that's true, then I'll, then I'll agree with it. I'll agree and amplify. I'm like, yeah, that's right. true. And if someone about me that's false, then it can't bother me too much because I know who I am and I know what I, I know what I stand for. So if someone says something that's wrong, I'm just like, well, yeah, that, well, that's not even, that's not wrong. So whatever you say about Zuby, whether you're right or, or whether you're wrong, then it's not really going to phase me. That's awesome. Zuby, thank you so much for your time. Can you just share uh, with the listeners uh, how they might find out more about you and anything you care to promote here? Yeah, absolutely. So you can follow me on all social media at Zuby Music. That is just Z-U-B-Y Music. I'm on Twitter, of course. I'm also on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Uh, My podcast, Real Talk with Zuby, is available on iTunes, uh, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, CastBox, YouTube, Spotify, all the usual places. And you can also find my music. I've got five albums and three EPs out there. All of those are available on the same usual digital music platforms. And if you would like to check out my book or any other work, just go to Zoo, uh, excuse me, zubimusic.com and there's links to everything on there. Right on. Thanks again for your time. I really appreciate it. That's all good, Anthony. 